Chapter 10, Introduction to Hypothesis Testing. Hypothesis tests are used as a way of making informed, objective decisions. The idea is that you want to be able to use the data in order to make the decision based on some type of science rather than a researcher making the decision his or herself or using anecdotal statements in order to make decisions. Researchers like to demonstrate through data that a phenomenon exists or does not exist. Consider cancer type research or other research in medical fields where they're trying to demonstrate that a pharmaceutical drug can cure a disease or can have some sort of a positive effect on an individual with a medical condition. Businesses like to make database decisions. They want to be able to mine the data that they have collected on their customers and use that information to make informed decisions based on future products and initiatives. There are certain assumptions associated with hypothesis tests that have to be met in order for the results of the hypothesis test to be accurate. Those assumptions include normality and independence. Observed responses are assumed to come from a normal distribution and to have somewhat of a bell shape themselves. So if you look at the data, you should be able to create a histogram and it should have somewhat of a bell shape to it. Not all hypothesis tests assume normality. There are some that don't require normality and if such is the case, then you don't have to check this assumption. Even approximate normality can lead to accurate results. Because of the central limit theorem, we are able to get fairly accurate results in hypothesis tests even if the data are not normal themselves. Normality may be determined by looking at plots like a histogram or by conducting normality tests. The assumption of independence implies that individual responses will be independent of each other. What that means is that the individuals in the study are not somehow connected in such a way that they will bias the results. One example of that would be if you're looking at blood pressures. If your individuals are patients and you're measuring the blood pressure of each of these patients under a certain condition, then one would assume that those individuals are not necessarily related. However, if all of your blood pressure measurements come from the same individual, then obviously those measurements would be related because they're all coming from the same person. When random selection is used in the study, independence is assumed to be met. So we don't necessarily do a test or look at a graph to determine independence. One of the steps of the scientific method is to form a hypothesis based on a research question. The null hypothesis, which we represent with an H and a subscript zero, we also call it H0, is the statement about the underlying assumption of the population parameter. The alternative hypothesis, denoted H with a subscript of A, also sometimes seen as H with a subscript of 1, is a statement opposing the null hypothesis. The purpose of the hypothesis test is to see if the collected data refute or fail to refute the null hypothesis. The process of testing a hypothesis follows the process that takes place in a court of law. We first assume that the null hypothesis is true unless it can be proven otherwise. Data are then collected as evidence and the test determines if there is enough evidence that shows that the null hypothesis is false beyond reasonable doubt. So you can think of the researcher as the prosecutor in a court. The researcher is trying to show that the evidence rejects the null hypothesis, just like the prosecutor in a trial is trying to collect evidence to show that an individual is guilty. The underlying assumption in the court of law is that the person is innocent until proven guilty. The underlying assumption in hypothesis testing is that the null hypothesis is true unless it can be proven false. There are only three possible null and alternative hypotheses. This first one is referred to as a two-sided hypothesis, and it is that the mean is equal to some hypothesized value versus that the mean is not equal to that hypothesized value. There are also two one-sided hypotheses. 
One of those is that the mean is less than or equal to some hypothesized value. The other is that it is greater than some hypothesized value. The alternatives are then the opposite of what the nulls are. So with the null being less than or equal, the alternative is greater than. With the null being greater than or equal, the alternative is less than. Notice that we use the population parameter instead of the sample statistic in our hypotheses. We do that because we are testing the population parameter. There is no need to test the sample statistic because that is our evidence. We already know what our evidence is, and so we don't try to test the evidence. We are testing the population values using the evidence. A positive or significant result is one in which the data are so different from what is expected by the null hypothesis that the researchers reject the null hypothesis. A negative or insignificant result is one in which the data are not so different from what is expected by the null hypothesis. The researcher is unable to reject the null hypothesis in such a case. If we consider the court of law situation, positive or significant results would be a guilty verdict. Enough evidence had been collected to prove that the person was guilty or enough evidence in our data was collected to prove that the null hypothesis is false. The negative or insignificant result in a court of law setting is like determining the person is not guilty. So there was not enough evidence to support the guilt of the person and because the default is that the person is innocent until proven guilty, we have to go with a not guilty verdict. In the hypothesis test situation, that would be the same as not having enough evidence in our data to prove that the null hypothesis is false. If we're unable to prove that the null hypothesis is false, beyond reasonable doubt, then we conclude that there is simply not enough evidence to support rejecting the null hypothesis. We don't say that the null hypothesis is true because we didn't prove that. Just as in a court of law, we don't say a person is innocent because we're not trying to prove that. We're trying to prove that the person is guilty, and if we're unable to prove that, then we say the person is not guilty. We don't say the person is innocent because we don't know that the person is innocent. We just say we were unable to prove guilt. So there's a very specific difference in those two types of wording that you have to keep track of. We have guilty versus not guilty in the court of law, and we have reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis in the hypothesis test setting. For example, a woman goes to her OBGYN for a mammogram, a low-dose x-ray of the breasts. The null hypothesis, which is the underlying assumption going into any type of a clinical test, is that the results are benign or that no breast cancer exists. The alternative, which is what the test is trying to bring out, is that the breast cancer does exist or that there is a significant or a positive result. A type 1 error is considered a false positive or rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact it is true. A type 2 error is a false negative, which is not rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact it is false. So in the example of the woman having the mammogram, a type 1 error or a false positive would be concluding that there is cancer when in fact there is not cancer. A type 2 error would be a false negative which is concluding that there is no cancer when in fact there is cancer. So in both of these cases an error was made. The Greek letter alpha, also called the level of significance, is the probability of making a type 1 error. The Greek letter beta is the probability of making a type 2 error. So one study on the internet listed the following information as a result of breast cancer screening. For women with breast cancer, it was shown that 80% of the mammography results were considered positive, while 20% were negative. For women without breast cancer, 10% were positive and 90% were negative. What that means is we have 20% false negatives and we have 10% false positives. There are two other terms that we need to discuss. 
One is sensitivity, which in statistics is also called power, and the other is specificity. Sensitivity is the probability that the test rejects the null hypothesis when in fact the null hypothesis is false. So it's the ability of the test to correctly find the problem. Specificity is the probability the test does not reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true, meaning correct negatives instead of false negatives. It also means the ability of the test to not say there's a problem when there isn't a problem. So again, looking at the results of the mammography study, the sensitivity or the power of the test is 80% because 80% of the time it correctly identified the breast cancer. The specificity of the exam is 90% because for women without breast cancer, 90% of the mammography results correctly came back negative. So looking at the null and alternative hypotheses, we mentioned that there are two-sided and one-sided hypothesis tests. What that means is for a two-sided test, we are worried about values being too small or being too large. And so we have two cutoffs. Anything below this cutoff is too small and anything above this cutoff is too large. Because of the tails in the distribution, the two-sided hypothesis test is referred to as a two-tailed test. In a one-tailed test, there is only concern about one side of the hypothesis. So only one side of the hypothesis is considered to be at issue. It could be the side on the left or on the right. Which side it is on depends on the sign in the alternative hypothesis. So for example, here we see an arrow pointing to the left. That indicates that we're worried about values that are too small. For the hypothesis with the arrow pointing to the right, we're worried about values that are too high. So to review the comparisons between the court of law and statistical hypothesis tests, we have these different bullet points. In a court of law, a person is innocent until proven guilty. In hypothesis testing, H0 is considered true unless rejected in favor of the alternative. In a court of law, the burden is on the prosecution to prove guilt. In hypothesis testing, the burden is on the researcher to prove that the null hypothesis is false. In a court of law, guilt must be proven beyond reasonable doubt using evidence. In statistical hypothesis testing, the researcher must prove H0 is false beyond reasonable doubt using data. The outcome of a trial in a court of law is guilty or not guilty. Innocent is not one of the outcomes. In statistical hypothesis testing, the outcome is reject H0 or do not reject H0. Accepting H0 is not one of the possible outcomes. Again, we consider one versus two-tailed tests. One versus two tails refers to the form of the alternative hypothesis. When we have not equals as our inequality sign, that means we have a two-tailed test. If we look at this T distribution, the hypothesis test is looking for extremes in order to reject the null hypothesis. So we hypothesize that the mean value is somewhere in the middle. If it turns out it is not exactly in the middle, that's okay. Remember, we're only going to reject the null hypothesis if we have sufficient evidence to the contrary. So if we find in our sample that the mean is somewhere between these two cutoff values, then we're okay. We recognize that the sample mean that we have computed is one of many possible samples that we could have collected. And each of those samples is going to give us a slightly different result. So as long as those slightly different results are close to what we're expecting, then we don't consider it supporting evidence for the alternative. However, if our sample mean is so far away from what the null hypothesis says that it should be, meaning way out in these tails, then we consider that sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Here we have a one-tailed hypothesis test where the cutoff value is on the right side of the graph. You can see that that is associated with an alternative hypothesis with the inequality sign pointing to the right. What that means is that the assumed value of our mean is right here. 
Any value less than that is okay. Even values that are slightly higher than that are okay. But our alternative is looking for something that is larger than our hypothesized mean. So if our sample mean is extremely larger than what we expected, then we would consider that sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. If it's less than, even if it's extremely less than, that still supports our null hypothesis. So we don't worry about that. Even if it's a little bit high, we don't worry about that. We only worry about extreme differences because, just like with the court of law, we're looking for proof beyond reasonable doubt. In this example, we have the cutoff on the left side of the graph, and that is associated with an alternative hypothesis with the inequality sign pointing to the left. So our hypothesized mean is right here, and if we find sample means that are greater than that hypothesized value, we don't worry about it because here we have greater than or equal to as our inequality sign in the null hypothesis. We're only worried about sample means that are extremely lower than what we hypothesized. So values that are extremely low beyond this cutoff point would be considered supporting evidence that the null hypothesis is not true. So the null hypothesis says the mean is up here. If our sample means way down here, then our sample data do not support the null hypothesis. So here are the general steps for conducting a hypothesis test using StatCrunch. First, we want to set up the test. We list the null and alternative hypotheses and determine the level of significance, alpha. How do we determine the level of significance? That is the value that the researcher is considering as an acceptable false positive rate. So if 5% is considered an acceptable rate of false positives, then 5% is what is chosen for our level of significance. Now, one would think that zero would be the only acceptable rate of false positives, but we can only get zero as our level of significance if, for example, our mammography screening never concludes that a person has cancer. Well, if it never concludes that a person has cancer, it's not very effective, is it? So having a false positive rate of zero means that we're probably going to have a pretty high false negative rate. We can't have our false positive or our false negative rate set at zero, so we have to find some kind of a happy balancing point where the false positive rate is maybe 5%, which then means that the false negative rate is going to be some value that is greater than zero but not too big. A typical significance level is 5% because that means we're going to have a 95% accurate test. Next, we conduct the analysis in StatCrunch or another statistical program. The result will include a value that is called a p-value. If the p-value, this number that it calculates, is less than our significance level or our false positive rate, then we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. If, however, that p-value is not less than alpha, our significance level or our false positive rate, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. The last step is then to state the conclusions of the test in the context of the study. Let's look at an example. A local dentist was interested in determining if the time needed to prep an operatory for a patient had changed from five minutes needed for the previous staff. Over a one-month period, a series of 25 preps were timed with an average prep time of 4.7 minutes and a standard deviation of 0.5 minutes. From the information given here in the problem, we should be able to conduct this hypothesis test. So we look for keywords in the statement. Is there anything in here to indicate whether the inequality sign in our hypothesis is going to be less than, greater than, or not equals? All we have is a statement here of had changed. It doesn't say had changed for the positive or had changed for the negative. It just says had changed. So it's just looking for a difference, whether that be positive or negative. In that case, it means that we're going to use the not equals sign in our alternative hypothesis. We're looking to see if the time had changed from five minutes. And so five minutes is what we hypothesize the value to be to begin with. And so our null and alternative hypotheses have five minutes as the means. We then want to test if the mean is equal to five minutes or not equal to five minutes. 
There is no indication in the above text as to the desired significance level. For example, do the researchers want a 95% test or a 99% test? In most behavioral science research, 95% is used for both confidence intervals as well as hypothesis tests. We will use that here. So our significance level is 1 minus our confidence level. So if it's a 95% test or a 95% confidence interval, then the significance level is going to be 5%. Again, we go back to the text to look for some key words. The values that we will need to know for StatCrunch are the sample mean, the degrees of freedom, the sample standard deviation, the null mean, and which inequality sign we're going to use for the alternative hypothesis. We can find all those values here in the text. The sample mean, it tells us, x bar is 4.7 minutes. So we know that the sample mean is 4.7. The degrees of freedom are based on the sample size. The degrees of freedom are equal to the sample size minus 1. In this case, the sample size is 25. And so we know that the degrees of freedom are 24. The sample standard deviation is also given to us in the problem as 0.5 minutes. We are trying to test the hypothesis that the prep time has changed from 5 minutes. So 5 minutes is the null mean. The other way we know that is we can look at our null hypothesis. Here it is. In the null hypothesis, we said that the mean is 5. Consequently, our null mean is equal to 5. The inequality sign in the alternative hypothesis is not equals. That is all the information we need for StatCrunch. In StatCrunch, we go to Stat, T-Statistics, One Sample, with Summary. Why? Because we don't have the data. We have the summary. We know what the mean and the standard deviation and so forth are. We don't know what the original data are. If we have the original data, then we can use with data. But if we just have the summary measures, then we would use with summary. We type in the sample mean, which was 4.7. We type in the sample standard deviation, which was 0.5. The sample size was 25 preps. Once we've entered the numbers, we click on Next. Then that asks us if we are wanting to do a hypothesis test or a confidence interval. So these are the same steps that we used to calculate confidence intervals in the previous chapter. Now we want to check the box for hypothesis test because we're going to conduct a hypothesis test. The null mean is the value of the mean under the null hypothesis. And we had that listed as 5. Here we are looking for the inequality sign in the alternative hypothesis. We listed that as not equals, and so that stays the same. Then we click on Calculate to get the results. Here is the output or the results of our hypothesis test. We can verify that it says our null hypothesis mean is equal to 5 versus our alternative hypothesis mean, which is not equal to 5. We can see that our sample mean is 4.7. The degrees of freedom are 24, which is 1 minus the 25 that we had in our study. The standard error is found the same way as it was in the previous chapter, where we take the sample standard deviation and divide by the square root of n. The t-statistic is taking our 4.7 from our sample mean and standardizing it by subtracting the mean of 5 and dividing by the standard error, which is 0.1. Then the p-value is 0 0.0062. The p-value is what we use to determine whether or not we reject the null hypothesis. Recall that for any hypothesis test, the results are determined as follows. We reject the null hypothesis if the p-value in the output is less than the significance level that we chose for our test. We do not reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is equal to or greater than the significance level that we chose for our test. Well, here's the p-value, 0 0.0062, and we chose 5% as our significance level. So we reject the null hypothesis because our 0 0.0062 is less than our 5%. In so doing, we conclude that the time needed to prep the operatory is not equal to 5 minutes. Now you can see that the 4.7 obviously is not 5 minutes, but the hypothesis test is looking to see how close or how far away is that sample mean 
from what we hypothesized. If it's really, really close, then we don't reject the null hypothesis. And 4.7 seems really, really close to 5, but it's not close enough. How do we determine what's close enough? Well, the test does that by looking at the t-distribution. In this case, it determined that 4.7 is not close enough to 5. So how does StatCrunch get these test results? Well, if you want to turn off your brain for just a few minutes, I'm going to explain the statistics that are going on behind the scenes. So we recall this picture right here for a two-sided hypothesis test. We have not equals for the inequality sign in the alternative hypothesis, which tells us that this is going to be a two-sided test. Well, how do we determine what those cutoff values are, and where does our mean go? We use the sample size to figure out the degrees of freedom for our t-distribution. Then we choose the cutoff values from the t-distribution such that in each of these tails we have 0 0.025, 0 0.025, or 2.5%. That leaves us the other 95% here in the middle. And so what we chose for our significance level was 5%. We wanted this to be a 95% test, and that's why we have 95% here in the middle. If you take the number of minutes and you standardize them by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, then what you end up with is our 5 here in the middle. That's our hypothesized 5 minutes. And then our standard error tells us how far we go out in either direction. We know that the sample standard deviation is 0.5, and if we divide that by the square root of our sample size, we get 0.1. And so then we go 5, 5.1, 5 5.1 5 .1 plus another 0.1 is 5.2, and then 5.3. We do that in both directions to see what standardized values go with each of the sets of minutes. So looking at the t distribution, it tells us, the, cal the calculator would tell us that this minus 2.06 is the t value that goes right here so that we can have 0.025 on this side and we can have 95% in the middle. It tells us that the positive 2.06, notice it's the same value as this negative except without the minus sign, goes right here and that's the value such that 2.5% is here in the tail and the 95% is in the middle. So that is how we get our setup. And then we're looking for where does our sample mean fall? Well, the sample mean is 4.7, which falls right here. You can see that the sample mean is clearly outside of what we consider acceptable. Here in the middle, we have fail to reject H0 because it's close enough to 5. So if we had 4.9 or 5.1 or 5.2, 4.8, we would consider those values close enough to 5 that we don't have enough evidence to reject the claim of 5 minutes. But if it's beyond that, if it's lower than this 4.8, or if it's higher than the 5.2, then we consider that as enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. We would consider that far enough away from 5. The p-value in this case is the probability of getting a sample mean more extreme than 4.7. That probability is found in StatCrunch by looking at the area here to the left of our test statistic. The area left of our cutoff value is two and a half percent, we already said that, and so we know that this uh, 4.7, our mean of 4.7 gives us an area here that is less than two and a half percent. And when we double it, because it's a two-sided test, we still get a value that is less than 0.05. So two things that the test looks at, and both things are exactly the same. One is, did our sample mean fall in the rejection area? Our rejection areas are out here in the tails. Reject and reject. And with our sample mean falling out here beyond our cutoff lines, 
we can see that it's in this reject area and that's why we reject the null hypothesis. The other way we look at it is looking at the p-value and we see that the p-value is, is really small. Well, because the p-value is determined by the sample mean, it's going to give us the same result whether we look at the picture and determine if the sample mean is inside or outside the limits or if we just look at the p-value. We will always get the exact same results. Here's another example. Seven overweight persons tried a particular diet for one month. The average weight loss of the seven individuals was three pounds with a standard deviation of five pounds. In order to do this in StatCrunch, you enter the appropriate values. You have the null hypothesis that the individuals did not lose weight versus that they did lose weight. So if there is weight being lost, then the average weight loss should be greater than zero. It should be a positive amount of weight that was lost. If the diet was not effective, then on average, either weight was not lost, meaning zero, or weight was gained, meaning weight loss is negative. So these are our null and alternative hypotheses. You notice that there is no mention of the number zero here in the statement, but you know that zero is what we should use because if no weight is lost, then that's the equivalent of zero pounds being lost. Now it says that the average weight loss of the seven individuals was three pounds. So we know that our sample mean is equal to three. It also says that there's a standard deviation of five pounds. So we know that our standard deviation for our sample is five. The sample size is not specifically mentioned, but it does say that there were seven people in the study. So n is equal to seven. If we go back to StatCrunch and we go to stat, t statistics, one sample with summary, then we can enter the values three for the sample mean, five for the sample standard deviation, seven for the sample size, click on next, indicate that we're doing a hypothesis test. We're comparing the null mean to zero, but in this case, our inequality sign under the alternative hypothesis is not not equals, it's the greater than sign. And that's what we have right here. Now, it's sometimes tricky to know whether you're going to use the greater than sign in the alternative or you're going to use it in the null. But you've got to think about what you're looking at. You could actually do this one of two different ways. You could either say that the seven individuals lost three pounds and have three as a positive number, like here, in which case you're going to use the greater than sign. Or you could say the average weight loss was three pounds and include a negative three as the amount of weight lost. And if you did that, if you used a negative to represent pounds lost, then you would have to switch the inequality signs. So you have to make sure that the numbers you use are consistent with the inequality signs that you use. If we select calculate, it gives us the results that we have here. Again, recall that for any hypothesis test, the results are determined as follows. Reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than alpha, or don't reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is equal to or greater than alpha. Here we have our p-value of 0 0.08. You can see that that value is higher than alpha, which is our 0 0.05, which we typically use. There is no mention of what significance level we should use, and if that's the case, just go ahead and use 0 0.05. The StatCrunch output indicates a p-value of 0 0.08, so we decide that we cannot reject the null hypothesis because 0 0.08 is larger than 0 0.05, so we conclude there is not enough evidence to prove the diet was effective. Okay, it looks like it might have been effective because they lost three pounds, but three pounds was not enough to consider it effective. Because remember, the three pounds is on average, which means that one of the persons might have lost weight, one of the persons might have gained weight, one of the persons might have had zero change in their weight. That's why we do this objective hypothesis test so it can determine on average whether or not the weight loss program was significant. Again, we're going here to the details of the hypothesis test. So if, if this is bothersome, then go ahead and skip this slide and move on to the next one.
The p-value in this case is the probability of getting a sample mean more extreme than three pounds. So the first thing we have to do is set up our graph. We have the t-values, which are 0, 1, 2, 3, and negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, just like with our normal distribution. And then we have pounds, which is the weight loss. So we have 0, we have positive weight loss, and then we have negative weight loss, which actually means weight gain. So once we've set up the graph like this, then we determine where is our cutoff. The cutoff is determined in the t-distribution such that the 5% is in the tail. In this case, we're doing a one-tail test. We don't have two tails, and so we want all 95% in the area where we say we fail to reject H0. And that leaves us with 5% in the reject H0 area. And so that's our cutoff point. We then look for where our sample mean falls. Well, the sample mean was three pounds, and so three pounds, here's 1.9 pounds, and here's 3.8, so it's somewhere around here, uh, three pounds. And that is associated with a line right here, which is inside the fail to reject H0 area it's not beyond our cutoff value of 1.943, which is a T value. So that's T of 1.943, which you can see is just to the left of our two, and that is associated with about 3.8 pounds. In order for the diet to be considered effective, weight loss would have had to have been at least 3.8 pounds, and it wasn't, and so it didn't fall in this rejection area. So where does that p-value of 0.08 come from? Well that refers to 8% of the area in the graph shaded that is beyond our sample mean. So here's our sample mean of 3 pounds and beyond that 3 pounds is an area shaded in of 8% or 0.08. And we know that that's bigger than our 5% because if you look at it, 5% is just that little shaded in area right there. 8% has much more shaded in. StatCrunch calculates all of this for us, so you don't have to worry about finding those values. You don't have to find this T value. You don't have to find the 8%. So this is just what's going on behind the scenes, so you have an understanding of what that is. Again, we go back to the court of law situation as a reminder and we recall that the burden is on the prosecution to prove guilt. The burden is on the researcher to prove the null hypothesis is false and it must be proven false beyond reasonable doubt using the data. So if we go back to our picture here, beyond reasonable doubt, here's, here's no weight loss. Zero right here means no weight loss and no weight gain. Anything in the positive direction is weight loss. Anything in the negative direction is weight gain. So anything down here does not show the diet to be effective, but anything over here shows that it is. In order to prove that it's effective, I mean, it has to be extreme. And so we're only going to say it's effective, not if it's greater than zero, but it has to be very greater than zero. It has to be way out here. So that's our way of adhering to the court of law situation where it's got to be beyond reasonable doubt. And that's why we have a cutoff value and say it has to go beyond that cutoff value in order for us to consider it significant. And that's why we don't put the cutoff value right here at zero and say, well, any weight loss is considered an effective diet because any weight loss could be, you know, that could just happen by somebody skipping a meal. And so it's not going to be considered effective unless it's beyond our certain cutoff point. The next thing we want to consider is hypothesis testing and confidence intervals and how they work together. Essentially, the math behind the hypothesis test is almost the same as the math behind the confidence intervals. So the confidence interval provides us about the same information as the hypothesis test. Again, we look at the example of the dentist looking for a change in the time for preparing the operatory. And so five minutes is what was hypothesized, but we've got a sample mean of 4.7 with a standard deviation of 0.5 and a sample size of 25. 
If we go to StatCrunch, recall that there was little difference between the steps we took in the StatCrunch for finding a confidence interval and finding a hypothesis test. Essentially, it was a difference of basically one mouse click. So if we go to Stat, T-Statistics, one sample with summary, this is the value that we use whether we're doing a hypothesis test or a confidence interval. So we know that the sample mean is 4.7. We know that the sample standard deviation is 0.5. And we know that the sample size is 25. Well, when we click Next, we have this next window. If we want to do a hypothesis test, we click this button. If we want to do a confidence interval, we click this button. So we're essentially doing the same steps. We gave it the same information. But if we click on this, we're going to do a hypothesis test. And if we click on this, we're going to do a confidence interval. So they're very, very similar in what they do and what information they require. So if we have this confidence interval and we click on Calculate, then it gives us the lower and upper limits for a confidence interval. How we can use that is we can determine whether or not the hypothesized value of five minutes falls in our confidence limits. Here we have a lower limit of 4.49 and an upper limit of 4.9. So the entire interval is less than our hypothesized value of five minutes. Because it is outside our interval, we consider it extreme or significant. And that would result in rejecting the null hypothesis. So we can use a confidence interval similar to how we use a hypothesis test. And if the hypothesized value falls within the confidence limits, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. But if it falls outside of the confidence limits, then that would be like rejecting the null hypothesis. So based on the results of the confidence interval, because the 5 falls outside of the confidence interval, our conclusion is to reject H0. And our interpretation is that we are 95% confident the time needed to prep the operatory is not equal to five minutes. In this case, we could say that it's less than five minutes. because the 4.7 is less than 5 and the 5 falls outside of our confidence interval. In the hypothesis test setup, recall that we have these cutoffs. And these cutoffs surround 5 in the middle here as our value under the null hypothesis. And so we're looking for values that are extremely far away from that null hypothesis mean. Well, that's the hypothesis testing setup. But for the confidence interval setup, it's different because the confidence limits in a confidence interval surround the sample mean, not the hypothesized mean. So if we look at this new graph, now we have the values surrounding the 4.7, which is our sample mean. So the cutoff points stay in essentially the same place on the graph, but because we've shifted all of our numbers over, now we have 4.7 in the middle, and we have 4.5 down here at this lower end, 4.9 at this upper end, and you can see our five minutes is outside of our interval. And so this is the setup of the confidence interval, whereas the previous was a setup of a hypothesis test. And so this way we can see that, yeah, clearly our hypothesized value of five minutes is outside of the confidence interval. So if we want to use a confidence interval to test the hypothesis, then that's what we're looking at. We're looking at creating the confidence interval using the sample mean and seeing if the hypothesized value falls inside or outside of our interval. So in summary, hypothesis testing allows researchers and businesses to make decisions based upon objective tests.
that they themselves are based on collected data. The process of testing a hypothesis follows the court of law process. Type 1 and type 2 errors can be controlled to an extent and help to determine the accuracy of a hypothesis test. Okay, remember the sensitivity and the specificity. We're looking at setting those values so that we can control what our rate is of false positives and our rate of false negatives. The test may be one-tailed or two-tailed, and confidence intervals as well can be used to test hypotheses, and in-hypothesis tests for means will arrive at the same results. And that is the end of Chapter 10, Introduction to Hypothesis Testing.